Welcome to Still Unbelievable, a podcast by Reason Press, where we examine religious claims, especially those made by Christians, and we regularly respond to items that are featured on the podcast, Unbelievable. We embrace dialogue, but as sceptical former believers, we will also criticise unfounded claims and unsupported beliefs. When I say the name Frankenstein, what image comes to mind? Are you familiar with the story of Frankenstein? And if so, which version? The original novel? One of the many films? Or perhaps the stage production? How well do you think you know the story? Test yourself by asking yourself this. Who is the hero of the story? Is there a hero? Who is the villain? Which character, or maybe there are several, best encapsulates evil in this story? Which character do you think has the most privilege? Which character, if any, gets treated unfairly? Now some of you already know that live theatre is a passion of mine, so it will be no surprise that during the coronavirus lockdown of 2020, I took great pleasure in watching the weekly YouTube broadcast of plays from the National Theatre. As an aside, if you have not seen live theatre, I wholeheartedly recommend it, be it professional or amateur. Just go and try it out if you've never done so before. You may well find yourself pleasantly surprised. I love the technicalities of putting on a play. This goes well beyond learning lines. It's also about timing of actions, trusting your fellow actors, testing the limits of your own dramatic abilities, and yes, overcoming nerves and keeping on going when it doesn't go quite so right on the night. Anyway, one of the plays that the National Theatre have broadcast is a stage adaptation of Frankenstein with Benedict Cumberbatch, an actor I admire as the eponymous Doctor. Though for me, the star of this particular show was Johnny Lee Miller as Frankenstein's creation. For those who may be unfamiliar with the story, the play opens with the creature having just been brought to life, coming to terms with being conscious and then learning how to make sounds, to move and then to walk and eventually feed itself, scaring away people along the way. After some time, the creature meets a blind farmer who, being unable to see its ugliness, takes care of him and educates him. So by the time we get to the second act, the creature is able to read and communicate. The creature is very much aware that everyone else finds it repulsive and it is rejected by everyone it comes into contact with. At last Frankenstein and his creation meets and the creature, on finding out more about how he's been created, requests that the doctor create him a partner. He's unhappy with the lonely life and having to constantly run away from those who would kill him. A partner to love and be loved by seems like a reasonable request and this would solve many of its problems. After all, if Frankenstein is enough of a god to create a man, he can create a woman too, can't he? It's not good for a man to be alone, is it? Does this concept seem familiar? Having reluctantly agreed to create a woman to be a partner for the creature, Frankenstein goes on the search for a suitable source body. However, when the moment comes, he has second thoughts. What if the woman objects and refuses to be bound by an agreement that was made before she existed? Frankenstein finds himself bothered by the thought and the morality behind it. It's as though he's suddenly developed a conscience and realises that his actions have consequences. The rationality and motives behind a single-minded dedication to his 
work are now being questioned and he is deeply uncomfortable with the position that he now finds himself in. Frankenstein realises that creating a woman for the company of the creature he previously created is not quite as simple as he thought. There are consequences for the woman. He realises that she will be an individual and capable of making her own decisions. Creating her for a purpose might conflict with her own preferences. This creates a serious moral quandary for him. And faced with this apparently unsolvable dilemma, Frankenstein reneges on his agreement, leaving the creature alone, disappointed, betrayed and angry. The creature, understandably, reacts very badly to this and, without wishing to give away too many spoilers for those yet to see the play, the result is a rather messy trail leading to the climax in the final scene where Frankenstein once more faces the creature and the inescapable and equally uncomfortable seeds of his blinkered arrogance. One gets the feeling that Frankenstein never really accepts responsibility for his part in the sweeping death and destruction that occurred during the story, or that he even considered how unappreciative the wider public are of his creation. Who is to blame for the creature being so poorly treated by all those who saw him? Can the creature really be held accountable for how he reacted to all that negativity and rejection? Did the creature really have a choice in how he behaved at any point during the story? You could say, yes, he did have a choice. He could have chosen not to kill those he killed. But ask yourself this. How much of the violence that the creature engaged in was self-defence after being ostracised and attacked by those who rejected him? And how much of it was he driven to through frustration after being created and then placed into a hostile environment for which he was unprepared and then, having asked for a remedy, was denied the very thing that would have brought meaning and happiness to his life? Does the creature have any choice or control at any point in the story. Was Frankenstein justified in making the creature? And having made the creature, was he justified in how he treated that creature? It was his creation, after all. So is he justified in breaking the promises he made? And was he justified in denying the creature even the smallest amount of respect? And finally, to return to my original question, the one I asked right at the start of this very short episode. Who is the real villain in this story? <laughs> it's Frankenstein, of course. He set everything in motion, and he alone is to blame for all that happened. You have been listening to a podcast by Reason Press. To get in touch, email reasonpress at gmail.com or see our website reasonpress.net where you'll also find our book Still Unbelievable. We welcome more feedback and you might even end up on an episode. Our theme music was written for us by Holly. You can hear more of her music at soundcloud.com slash hollybishop. You can support us by buying some of Holly's music and telling her we sent you. Thank you.